our one o'clock presentation um, will be by Yair, Yair Levy and Tommy Polak. Um, Tommy is from Tidewater Community College and Yair is from Nova Southeastern. And they'll be talking to you about the human factor in cybersecurity. Um, and then our two o'clock presentation will be um, by Dr. Yeselada and Dr. Endicott Pukowski um, from University of Washington and Portland State University. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Levy. Hi there, uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. This is a very exciting uh, opportunity and uh, I would like to thank uh, Jill and Amy uh, for helping us facilitate this. Uh, today we're going to talk about the human factor in cybersecurity. Um, uh, specifically, uh, I will start with an overview of a couple of presentations uh, regarding the foundational topic, what we do in my uh, research group, and, uh, and then we'll look uh, at more specifically at the research uh, that Tommy is, is doing. I will hand it over to Tommy and he will cover uh, more specifically about his area. So uh, briefly, I'm not gonna waste too much time, but uh, most of you uh, know me already. I'm a professor of IS and cybersecurity at Nova Southeastern University. And I'm also the director of the CAE Center at the school. Tommy is one of my uh, PhD students who is uh, about to have his dissertation proposal approved and get the research conducted. So this is a great uh, opportunity uh, for him to also present his research. With that uh, further ado, I wanna uh, talk briefly on um, the um, work that we do in, in my group, in my research group. We focus specifically on the human factor of cyber uh, in the context of the three um, areas or interconnections uh, between technology, the human computer interaction area, and the socio-political or organizational. And so over the years, I'm gonna give you a, a brief overview of a couple of the uh, work that we've been doing and some of the ongoing research studies um, but I want to give you a, a little bit of, of inspiration regarding what we have in terms of um, uh, uh, the human factor in cybersecurity. So well, what is that? What exactly is going on there? We've seen, uh, and uh, those of you who are following some of the Verizon data breach investigations uh, report, that is uh, contributed uh, to that report by uh, the FBI and U.S. Secret Services, DISA, uh, CISA, and some other uh, federal agencies are contributing to that report as well to help us, you know, get get an overview of aggregated uh, information regarding the cyber uh, incidents that we're seeing. And so, for years, we've been seeing the social fishing to be one of the top uh, problems uh, in terms of how cyber criminals penetrate their organizations. And uh, you can see here in 2015, it was uh, the second uh, to the top. And over, the, uh, over time, it actually elevated itself, uh, fluctuates a bit, but then elevate itself to, to be the first one uh, nowadays uh, in uh, 2020, the final report. But what we noticed is in the 2020 report, there was a starting uh, emphasis on something that we have been investigating for some time already. And it's really the issue of uh, the human error. And, and we as humans, that's, that's, that's part of the human factor is that we make mistakes. I mean, if we want it or not, we do. And when it comes to cybersecurity, the problem is that our mistakes are very costly, both for the organization and uh, for ourselves personally. And that's where we wanna pay closer attention to what can we do about that. And that's really what we've been doing in my research group uh, over the last couple of years. And so we noticed that in the same report, there were two other items that uh, previously were not as high on the list. 
uh, but they're moving higher into the uh, top five, uh, specifically the, those that are under the umbrella of what we call human error. And uh, so you can see here the misdelivery of, of, of uh, content or uh, emails uh, that may contain you know, um, uh, sensitive information or misconfigurations by IT uh, professionals, specifically when it comes to their intrusion detections, intrusion prevention systems, firewalls, and other SOC uh, security operations center related uh, platforms uh, that's supposed to help the organization, uh, networking infrastructure, all of these uh, misconfigurations can be very costly. And we have documented cases where the FBI and the Secret Services have been evaluating more closely some of the uh, incidents that happened uh, that cost the organization significant amount of money as a result of uh, IT individuals are just doing human error. I mean, just uh, judgment errors, right? Uh, more, more specifically, we have been monitoring what the FBI, if you're not aware of the IC3, the Internet uh, Computer Complaint Center from uh, the FBI headquarters have been putting up. So over the years, we've been monitoring some of their reports specifically on business email compromise because most of these are... Um, uh, entering uh, or are caused by human error or uh, by lack of focus by some of the uh, individuals. And as we uh, look at it, uh, the report in 2017 was uh, really significant. It shows over $5 billion in a period from October 2013 to December 2016 as uh, 5 billion with a B dollars expenses uh, the cost for uh, organizations worldwide. Uh, and that was in May 2017. A similar report was really uh, blew us uh, away with uh, July 2018 when the FBI reported uh, that uh, the accumulation of additional year of uh, business email compromise cases uh, rose to 12, over $12.5 billion. Uh, and, and don't forget, these numbers are reported. So we anticipate that about 50% or even more of organizations worldwide are not fully reporting uh, or not disclosing to uh, their agencies or, or law enforcement groups uh, about their losses. They just pay ransomware, for example, and continue with their uh, operation or or they just go bankrupt uh, and uh, and it's not really reported as uh, a result of a ransomware or a massive cyber attack or, or business you know compromise and um, so that was 2018 in 2019 September 2019 the same IC3 by the FBI reported and we were just astonished um, came with these numbers of $26 billion losses for organizations as a result of business email compromise uh, cases. So we've been looking into what caused people, especially uh, you know, executives in our organizations and uh, those who own, uh, you know, make decisions, financial decisions for organizations to make make mistakes in general, what, what, what can help us? And so I, I uh, looked into some of the theoretical uh, grounds behind uh, what caused people to uh, make uh, human error. And I stumbled upon the work of uh, Dan Kahneman and Amos Trubetsky. Uh, Dan uh, Kahneman is a Nobel Prize uh, winner of economics, the 2002 Nobel Prize in economics. He's uh, originally Israeli, but many years have been in uh, Princeton. So he's uh, 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 from Mauritius, uh, from Princeton. His uh, Nobel Prize is really on the uh, analyzing the way people make decisions in the uh, economic field, but his 
uh, foundational theory and work that he established was based on his collaboration with Amos Trevitsky from uh, Stanford, who uh, have done massive research in trying to understand how humans think and, and simplify the way we think into those two uh, types of systems and what they came up with over the years. And by the way, in, in, this, in this book specifically, The Thinking Fast and Slow, Dan uh, Kahneman is, is writing uh, a little bit about, uh, is more of an anecdote and his own uh, perspective of what he think over the, in, in small stories that uh, were validated by his research with either his doctoral students or Trevetsky over the, uh, from the 1970s all the way to the 1990s. Um, and then uh, the other one is uh, the Undoing Project is an interesting paper, you may, a uh, book, you may want to read that if you're interested in, in the whole aspect of, of how we, uh, as humans, we make mistakes. So coming back to it, and essentially what he said is that we as humans have two systems. So if I asked you to quickly look at these two examples and try to solve them, your brain will automatically gravitate towards the one that is on the left because it's easier. It's just, that's the way it is that your brain is operating. And uh, so obviously uh, your, your brain automatically will jump in and say four. Well, without even thinking, uh, you would jump and do that, right? And we'll talk about that uh, shortly, but uh, to do 22 by 17, it may take you a while. And this, this is exactly what, uh, uh, it boils down to that tasks that are a little bit more complex, sometimes our brain will shift directly into the easy tasks. And that is a big problem in cybersecurity. And I'll discuss that shortly. And that will lead also to what Tommy's uh, research that we'll be discussing as well uh, in a moment. So what they've learned, and by the way, later on in the late 90s, uh, early uh, 2000s were validated using fMRI is that the brain, and that, that's a result why uh, he received the Nobel Prize is, is because of the confirmation over fMRI on that, uh, is that we have really two sets of, of systems, if you will, if we want to simplify it in our brain. And most of the time, our, the way we operate is on system one that it's very fast, it's uh, automatic, it's impulsive. Think about uh, things that, are, that you've done, uh, let's say, uh, you know, you got into the, now with COVID-19 it's different, but let's say you got into a mall and you're thinking, did I lock the car, yes or no? And you walk back and you actually see that the car is locked. Well, guess what? You locked the car, but you don't remember that. And essentially what happens is your system one perform that uh, task without you even remembering it because it was more of, of autonomous uh, type of process. Whereas there are certain things that you need to slow down and really think thoroughly and um, to reflect and kind of brainstorm, if you will, a little bit more, uh, that takes effort and that is what, uh, uh, Kahneman basically noted as called system two. And, and that is where we would like people to be when they're making cybersecurity related decisions. But unfortunately, in most of the cases, their system one jumps uh, forward and do that. And, and I'll discuss that. I call this the oh shit syndrome. I'm sorry, uh, oh shoot syndrome, right? How many times uh, you know that you've received or someone that you know uh, have received uh, a notification on your um, uh, smartphone uh, or a mobile device and um, you just clicked okay and then you're like, oh shoot, what did I just do? Uh, and then you're thinking, oh wow, did I just allow some app access to all of my uh, pictures or did I just allow certain rights uh, without even thinking. Why? Uh, because your uh, system one jumps forward and basically um, 
clicked on that okay for you. Uh, and, and that's really an issue that we've been training individuals. I'll give you another example. How many times, uh, you know, people get an email and they click on the attachment and then they think, oh, shoot, maybe that includes some, something that I shouldn't click on. And, and the problem is that we have been training people over time uh, to do things and we trained our brain as well to do certain things uh, which um, cause our system one to build up. You can think about other reasons where system one building is good, for example. The way we train uh, teenagers and, and early, uh, you know, early drivers on how to operate a car is by practice. Uh, to get them to practice a lot. And as you practice a lot, you basically build your system one. So if God forbid there is someone who, let's say you're driving and someone jumps in front of your car, uh, you're gonna be pressing your, the brakes as hard as you can. And then you're gonna, your brain will just realize that your system one was activating your leg to press on the brake because of your <clears throat> continuous training uh, of doing that. And so uh, system one is more of an, an effortless type of uh, approach uh, where your brain operates, uh, you know, all, almost uh, based on, uh, on intuition. Uh, and then system two is where we want people to be when they're dealing with cybersecurity related activities. And that is more uh, uh, lengthy um, effort. Uh, is required for that. There have been a lot of, uh, you know, uh, research studies uh, conducted, on, uh, conducted on Kahneman's uh, theory and the whole philosophy of the system one and system two. We are just uh, very uh, happy to grab uh, that theory and, and use that in the context of cybersecurity because we think that it fits very nicely. Uh, to help us understand certain uh, instances, specifically in the area of phishing and business email compromise and, uh, and small business uh, decision making areas like that. So I've been working over the years with, and some of my uh, former uh, doctoral students are attending our session now. And so I've been working over the years with, um, and also current, uh, um, doctoral students. I've been working over the years with uh, Melissa uh, from uh, 2013 to 2016 on a research study to analyze a little bit more the area of skills and competencies related to cybersecurity. We, we've, uh, and we've published a couple of uh, papers. We got a, a grant also. We, what we learned deeper is the process of how individuals build their skills and build their competency because when you build your skills and competencies, you basically enhance your system one in a right way. And that was really the foundation for that. So Melissa, uh, Dr. Carlton worked with me to uh, build up uh, an app that we've uh, used and we consulted with uh, experts from the FBI to build uh, an assessment for hands-on assessment of actual skills. And, and to measure skills, you really need to throw people into an experience and, and see how they behave, how they react. Um, uh, Dr. Nielsen, uh, Rick Nielsen worked with me uh, on trying to understand where is this, this threshold for competency? Where, what combination of, of these uh, KSAs, if you will, the knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, combine will help us to achieve, if, uh, if you think about a driver license, at what point do we tell an individual, hey, your competency level is at, at the right threshold that we are okay for you to get a driver license versus someone who failed your driver license, uh, right? So, so this is where uh, the philosophy was on, on cybersecurity. Um, of course, there are a lot of challenges because cybersecurity is very large uh, area and there are plenty of components. Uh, I worked with Will Perez as well. Dr. Perez and I worked on developing a simulation for uh, to measure cyber situational awareness and cyber curiosity. Uh, we developed an app with multiple 
uh, scenarios and we tested that in the context of maritime. He was the uh, IT security for Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines at the time. And uh, we measured that on the bridge of uh, those ships, which was very interesting. Um, Dr. Aviv uh, seen, uh, worked with me. We also developed a, an application uh, both for Android and iPhone that help us uh, conduct some mini experiments on, um, on uh, business email compromise detection, the ability for business owners to, uh, for executives to be able to detect certain anomalies when it comes to business email compromise. Uh, I'm currently working with uh, Gabriel, uh, who is uh, specifically analyzing a very large amount of data from the Price Waterhouse Cooper database on all the large uh, data breaches over the last uh, 10, 11 years actually, to try to categorize those into the type of errors. And that, once we uh, get that done, we'll publish that. Uh, Dr. Cooper, who's on the line today, has just graduated and she's been working, she worked with me and we're publishing her work as well on the philosophy of trying to shift individuals from their system one to system two in the context of phishing emails. Uh, we took the con concept of what uh, automobile has been doing for the last many years to try to shift individuals from system one to system two with the dashboard, uh, AV and, and different haptics. So audio visual warnings type of a thing and haptic alerts on mobile devices. Uh, I'm working with uh, Amy who's also on the line who will present her paper in an upcoming uh, conference um, on uh, the philosophy that we've learned from the ER and also from pedestrians uh, that using uh, timers uh, to allow individuals to pause actually help move the individuals from system one to system two as well. So we're trying to see if that can help us in the context of phishing email to have people just uh, required to pause uh, a certain amount of, of seconds before they can click on anything on email. Uh, we're learning that worked in other fields, so we're trying to look if that helps as well. Javier is working with me, by the way, that's my dog uh, who was trained as well. Uh, Javier was, is working with me to try to look at EEG uh, analysis. Uh, we're, we're seeing that there a lot of information we can uh, draw from brain signals, from eye tracking movement, from mouse cursor tracking, uh, to try and understand that in the context of, of also malware attack. I have a couple of other projects in the context of more organizational risk. Specifically, we're looking at small or uh, executives in small organizations and how they make decisions is, is the human factor. Uh, we're looking at uh, some uh, following. So uh, Emmanuel is working with me on, on uh, the philosophy of, of um, uh, the uh, chemical uh, component transportation uh, placards that they use on, on, on uh, trucks, etc. We were thinking on applying the same classification hazard and labeling to cybersecurity on mobile devices. And Patricia is working with me on a trying to develop a competency framework following the NIH one. I'm collaborating with the University of Pisa, Professor Federico Nicolini and Professor Gianluca Dini and also Martina Neri, uh, who is on the line, I think, today from Firenze, University of Firenze, uh, as well on, on small businesses and the, or, uh, the executives in small businesses and business owners, their uh, awareness of risks. Okay, so with that, uh, obviously I'm also working with Tommy, which he's gonna be taking over uh, now and talk about his uh, specific research in more details. Go ahead, Tommy. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being here to help support our research. Today we will discuss how users' judgment can be affected by different environmental factors while using different device types. Next slide, please. 
As noted er in earlier slides, phishing continues to be one of the top threats to computers and mobile devices for financial gain. Deceptive search engine results also pose an issue because of search engine poisoning techniques used to promote these malicious sites to the top of the first page of the search engine. Many of, these, many of the cyber criminals are also buying ad space to bypass any security measures that the search engine operators have uh, deployed. Mobile phones are even more vulnerable due to screen size and poor application security, and many of these users are unwillingly connect to uh, malicious, unsecure public networks. Next slide, please. For our research problem, this research will focus on financial losses that can be that occur to, to users and organizations due to users' judgment errors when dealing with phishing emails or clicking on malicious links in the search end result. Cyber criminals seem to stay ahead of uh, security measures by employing increasingly ingenious schemes to take advantage of the errors and judgment that users make when faced with their schemes. Next slide, please. Phishing scams are one of the oldest social engineering methods for monetary gain. Social media has made this easier because it's easier to gather data needed to fake uh, to create, create fake identities because users on social media sites readily share information or often do not secure their profiles. Social engineering definition we are using here for social engineering consists of persuasion techniques to manipulate people and to perform actions or divulging confidential information. Next slide, please. The environment has either pro can have either a positive or negative effect on the way users perform tasks at work, at home, or out in public, and coupled with the, b the background noise, adding distractions to the environment, task performance tends to decline because the interruptions of the attentive process of working memory Cognitive, you know, this causes cognitive overload and people have issues concentrating on more than one task at a time. Next slide, please. Humans are the weak link in any process and they often make bad decisions and choices when faced with uncertain stressors and distractions. Some of these choices are in, were influenced by factors such as reason and belief, each of which can involve either bias or implicit, whether implicit or in, unconscious. And all these cited researchers on this slide have made extensive contributions to the field of human error along the way and along with those that are, many of those that are not cited. Here's our methodology for our research study. It's broken down into three phases. We are currently into phase one, where we're doing subject matter expert Delphi rounds, where, where we were asking the subject matter experts to validate two experimental tasks and, and eight experimental protocols, which will be asked for resource questions one and two. After we have those validated, we will move to phase two, which will conduct a uh, pilot test with 10, 10 users, which using research questions th three through six. And this pilot testing will use to determine if any adjustments need to be made and the process and how they, how they are de delivered and calculated. Once the adjustments Final adjustments have been made. We'll move into three, phase three of our research study, where we'll, we'll again be using research questions three through six to determine if any research conclusions and recommendations. Next slide, please. Research questions in one and two, as stated earlier, they're part of phase one. They were used to determine the two SME validated experimental tasks and the eight experimental protocols. These will use the assess the user's judgment 
when exposed to two types of simulated social engineering attacks based on the environment and the device type. Research questions three and four will use statistical measures to assess the judgment of, or lack of judgment errors divided into environment and device type. Next slide, please. And re research question five will use the same statistical measures used in research questions three and four, combining all of them in, into the device types and, and, and environments. And then finally, research question six will further break down the statistical measures using demographical indicators as a control. Here we have our experimental, experimental framework for our eight IQ mini tests that we will be uh, constructing. These two sets of validated experimental tasks are represented by giving, giving an, us our eight experimental protocols broken down into the two environments and to the two device types. Next slide, please. This, shot, this slide will sh shows our overall flow of the research, starting with the two devices, moving into our environment where we'll do doing our testing or with our IQ tests. Then we will process our data. Then we will determine if there are any judgment errors or not. And then we will take those numbers and we will do our statistical measures. Here are some of the samples of the phishing IQ tests that we'll be asking the uh, subject matter asper, experts to um, evaluate. Next slide, please. And this will be uh, examples of uh, the search engine results using different uh, search engines. Next slide, please. As part of our SME survey process, each SME will be asked to rank their top choices on physical environmental types and AV distraction levels. Next slide, please. Here are those uh, SME choices are divided into the two categories of physical environment and the AV distraction level. Okay, so uh, I'm back again. And what we would like to do is really uh, uh, run a quick uh, poll for you. And first, uh, just to tease you a little bit and see uh, uh, how uh, our questions are appearing. Uh, so we would like you all to vote uh, for our uh, polls. Uh, we have multiple, we have four of them. Uh, I hope you can vote on these separately, uh, each one. Um, hold on, can we? Uh, Looks like folks are voting. Okay, okay, it says that, uh, okay, thank you. If you don't see it on your screen, if you go to the bottom and click polling, yes. it, it should show up. <laughs> yes, I, uh, yes, thank you. I do see it now. It said before attendees are not viewing, of course. Okay. Yes, only one choice. I think it, it should allow you only, oh, is it set up that it allows you only one choice across all of them? It should be one choice yeah. per question. Um, you know, I'm I'm not sure Amy set it up um, and she had to run, um, <laughs> but I okay. believe it's set up that way, but um, I'm not can sure. Can someone confirm that you can choose uh, one answer per question? In looks the like, area? It, it looks like they're doing it. These are check boxes. Okay, so please, okay, got it. So please just, select one per uh, question if you don't mind. Uh, so our first question is basically looking at the uh, most destructing environment and we're looking at both uh, mobile and, and computer. Uh, we want to know what's your perspective in terms of the environment. Uh, would the airport environment, coffee shop, lecture hall, or during a meeting will be uh, a consider as your uh, most destructing. Uh, the second question talks about uh, six to uh, measure the least destructing environment from your perspective. Um, and we uh, provided an option for an office settings. So 
So think about you sitting in, sitting in your office, you sitting in your home, uh, sitting in a hotel room or sitting in a library or a bookstore would represent a least distracting environment. Uh, the third question we have, because we're running also out of time here, it talks specifically about the destruction level itself, uh, not really the environment. Um, so in this case, would continuous background noise drive you crazy? <laughs> or would it, uh, visual destruction be um, uh, the, the case? Or a destructing loud music, although we know that some people may think that loud music may not be distracting for them. And so, uh, but it, or all of those combined. So think about uh, continuous background noise that it, with visual distractions, with some uh, loud uh, noise. The fourth question asks about uh, the best uh, non-destructive environment in terms of, of the destruction level. So would a quiet environment, uh, let's say think about, I'm thinking about my living room uh, at home, uh, would a relaxing background in my living room work out without any visual distractions uh, uh, will work? All of these combined or would just one out of the three will make it the most important for you? And so this process, and we have a few more also on the IQ tasks and the procedures that we'll be doing during the experiment. Uh, so if you don't mind, let's take another uh, minute to finish the voting. Please uh, go ahead and complete the voting. Uh, you can scroll down uh, to see the other questions. So if you don't see all the questions, just scroll down and you should be able to see um, the other questions as well. And if you don't mind to, uh, uh, okay, if it doesn't work for you, then you try try to move the, the cursor on top of where the poll area is. Uh, and uh, by the way, I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you for all of you guys um, that uh, voted. We, this is really just a tease. Uh, we would like to ask if you're interested and you have expertise in cybersecurity. Uh, I think most of you on this session um, would like to volunteer and help Tommy and us during this research. I'll, we'll provide Tommy's email at the end uh, for you to uh, communicate with us, uh, to participate in the real expert uh, panel uh, process. So what we're, we're, we're seeing, just so I, I will give you an update on what uh, we have right now, is uh, question number one, basically, uh, that we had uh, airport came about as 53% and the rest are below 20. Uh, for question two, uh, we are seeing that uh, there is a, a home environment is really 38% uh, as the uh, least distracting, followed by a library bookstore at 28%, uh, an office setting at 28% as well. Um, we are uh, in the third question that we have, uh, Audiovisual, all of the above came at 52%, uh, followed by 21% uh, destructing live, uh, uh, loud music. And the last question, the fourth question we have for you for today was uh, regarding the uh, relaxing and the quiet environment came out first as 52% followed by uh, all of the above at 27%. So thank you so much. Uh, for that, I'm going to share the result quickly from, with all of you, so you can just quickly see that. I don't know if uh, everyone can see, and then we can, uh, tell me can continue. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop the sharing, and Tommy, go ahead. Uh, next slide, please. Subject matter experts for the phishing IQ and the search engine IQ tests will be 
give, also giving a similar poll or survey actually, uh, asking them to either keep the selected email or search engine result revise or replace each sample. Options B and C will, will be given a section for the SMEs to put their comments in for, to explain their answers. Next slide, please. As noted in previous slides, data collected from the SME surveys will be used to create eight mini IQ tests based on the environment and device type. These IQ tests are based on prior literature and industry tests. And this, after the SME survey, an application delivery system will be developed to collect in quantitative and qualitative data from the research participants. Next slide, please. This is, this is the sample of phishing email that will be uh, presented in the survey. As noted earlier, the revised replace options will have an option for the SME feedback in order to help improve the process. Next slide, please. The expansion of mobile phone usage worldwide has exponentially increased the, increased the phishing attempts through the use of scams through social media, clickbait links, email, and QR codes. The users are used to that are used to sharing links through social media applications are making themselves more vulnerable to phishing attacks and scams due to having a low sense of risk because they're getting used to ha or habituated into sharing links. The current COVID-19 restrictions have created an, a distracting environment problem in itself for parents, for parents that are working at home now and then their children are, are doing dis distance learning. So the, so this distracts the, the parent away from their work tasks while they help their children navigate the remote learning process. Phishing attacks are becoming more sophisticated as technology improves. Cyber criminals are able to spoof official looking emails or websites and or together financial details of unsuspecting users. When their number of distractions increases, cognitive cues decrease due to the a cognitive overload. The decision-making process is negatively affected, causing a potential for judgment errors. The results of the study will, be, will provide uh, input to the body of knowledge on user susceptibility to social engineering tax and distracting and non-distracting environments while using mobile phones and computers. Prior liter literature has indicated that varying demographic indicators also play a role in phishing judgment errors. Additional assessments of the experimental data with the interaction of the different demographic indicators may help further uncover potential groups that are more susceptible to social engineering attacks. Future research may also expand to other types of social engineering attack types and future research may build on this research to propose policies related to the use of devices in distracting environments, especially mobile phones. And lastly, we, so, yeah, go ahead. If, if anybody would like to participate in uh, subject matter expert surveys, please uh, email me. Yes, uh, maybe uh, put that in the chat, put your email in the chat area as well. Uh, and I want to thank uh, again uh, NSA and the CAE community for allowing us to have this uh, talk today. And thank you everyone for attending this presentation. And uh, if uh, you're interested in our research or would like to brainstorm or anything that you would like, uh, by all means, more than happy, uh, drop me an email, my email. I'm going to put that also in the uh, chat area. It's levyy at nova.pu. Oops, I just mistyped it. I don't know if uh, any questions, if we have time. I think we are about reaching our time, but if there is any. You have some time if folks have questions. Thank you. So any questions? Uh... Okay, so um, feel free to reach out to me or Tommy or both of us if you're interested. Thank you.
thank you for the opportunity. Thank you both very much. Everyone else, um, we're going to take a short break, um, but please be back here at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time um, for our second presentation. Thank you very much.
for those of you that are just tuning in, we'll get started at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you. Once again, if you're just joining us, we'll get started in about five minutes at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. <laughs> 